All right, so welcome back um, to the second set of papers this afternoon. It's a pleasure to introduce Erin Shea, who's from uh, Grinnell College, and her paper uh, today will be Clothing the Hatun, Mongol Women's Dress and Political Power. Erin. Thank you so much. Thank you especially to Betsy and to Itai for inviting me here today and the staff of the BGC for making us all so welcome and everything happens so smoothly. It's really exciting to be here in person. Um, so as the title and the abstract of my paper indicate, I will be talking you, to you today about Mongol women's court dress, centering the discussion on the Yuan court in China. But as I was reflecting on this topic, I realized that there was another issue that I, I think really deserves discussion. And this is the issue of what it meant to identify as a subject of the Mongol empire by different people in different parts of the empire. Does this work? Which one do I press? Like that? Mm -hmm. Click. There we go. Okay, sorry. So an elite woman living in Dadu, the Yuan capital, likely had a different relationship to the Mongol Empire than an elite woman living in Tabriz in the Ilkhanate or in Sarai in the Golden Horde. For that matter, an elite woman living in Dadu probably had a different relationship to the Mongol Empire than one living in present-day Gansu province in the northwest part of China or in Jiangsu in the southeast. So while, as you will see, my arguments about Mongol women's court dress point to a pan-Mongol courtly idiom that expressed specific messages about identity and power, I think it's also important to look beyond the court and reflect on the diversity of elite women's identities in the Yuan and the Mongol Empire more broadly. All this to say that today I propose to spend the first part of my presentation giving you a sense of women's court dress in the Yuan and the greater Mongol Empire, while the second half of my presentation will introduce some material about elite women living in different parts of the Yuan territory and their relationship to the Mongol Empire as seen through dress in a funerary context. I'm at the beginning of this work and I would like to eventually expand this study to include analysis of these same topics in other parts of the Mongol Empire, such as the Ilkhanate and the Golden Horde. But for today, it seems best to stick to the Yuan so I won't go over 30 minutes. <laughs> um, a side note that I focus on the court and the elites because they're the groups for which we have the best evidence. I think most of you probably realize that, but I think it's worth mentioning. As the project moves forward, I hope it will become more inclusive of non-elites, but I am working with the evidence that I have at hand right now. So let's begin with an introduction to what Mongol women's court dress. Mongol women's court dress was recognizable across Asia and even to a certain extent into the Mediterranean in the 13th and 14th centuries. Mongol court dress was certainly a dress of power and comparisons between Ilkhanid manuscript paintings, Yuan tomb murals, Yuan imperial portraits and excavated materials show a standard repertoire of clothing types, namely for women, the tall bokta crown and a wide court robe. The bokta was the signature headgear of Mongol married women, made of a birch bark interior covered in cloth and adorned with precious materials such as stones, pearls, beads, and feathers. The bokta was commented on at length by visitors to Mongol courts and was an essential feature of Mongol women's court dress. In paintings from the Yuan and the Ilkhanate, the robe and the bokta are almost exclusively depicted in red, while the excavated material, mostly from the area of the Yuan dynasty, preserves gold woven variations of the robe and the bokta. This corresponds to what we know of the most favored Mongol court material called nasij and generally believed to be gold woven lampus. The discrepancy between the painted iterations of this dress and the preserved textiles might be explained by nasij being the most valued textile used by the Mongol court at the time. Red silk court robes may have been more widespread, but the value of the Nasij version of court dress made it a valuable article to inter with the deceased. 
Because people, both ancient and modern, love the Bokhta, I'm going to take a few minutes to look more closely at it and the jewels and metalwork that decorate the most elaborate versions of this hat. The Bokhta was remarked upon by all the visitors to the Mongol courts who left travel accounts, and they are similar in terms of their description, but the Flemish Franciscan William of Rubric, who visited various Mongol courts and hordes between 1253 and 1255, probably gives the most detail. So I think it's worth reading. Um, quote, they have also an ornament for their heads, which they call bota, being made of the bark of a tree or of other such, some such light material. It is so thick and round that it cannot be held but in both hands together. And it has a square sharp spire rising from the top more than a cubit high and fashioned like a column. This book that they call, cover all over with a piece of rich silk. It is hollow within and upon the spire or square top. They put a bunch of quills or of slender canes, a cubit long and more. This tuft they beautify with peacock's feathers and round about its length with feathers of a mallard's tail and with precious stones. Great ladies wear this kind of ornament upon their heads, binding it strongly with a certain hat, which has a hole in the crown fit for the spire to come through. Under it, under this ornament, they gather up their hair in a knot and they bind it un strongly under their throats. When a great company of such gentlewomen riding together are beheld far off, they seem to be soldiers with helmets on their heads, carrying their lances upright. Certainly, the impressive height of the bokta was striking, but so were the materials used to adorn it. We know the bokta could be made of felt or silk, although only silk remains have been unearthed. As Li Zhichang of the Song Dynasty, who recorded the visit of the Taoist master Chang Chun to the court of Chinggis Khan in 1221, notes, <clears throat> the married women wear a headdress of birch bark some two feet high. This they generally cover with a black woolen stuff but some of the richer women use red silk. The end of this headdress is like a duck. They call it gugu. They are in constant fear of people knocking against it and are obliged to go backwards and crouching through the doorways of their tents. <laughs> so black felt was probably the more common material used in the bokta for covering the bokta. But in terms of court dress, it seems that either red silk or nasij, so gold woven lampus was used based on uh, depictions and written descriptions of court ceremonies. Let's take a closer look at these co courtly boktas. In the paintings of Yuan empresses, such as this one of Chabi, the consort of Kublai Khan, we see that her bokta is made of, presumably, red silk, adorned with large pearls and topped by a tuft of feathers. The cap is secured to Chabi's head by a strap that is tied under the chin. While Chabi's bokta here is adorned with pearls, we know from archeological evidence that it might have been decorated with other stones as well. This bokta ornament was uncovered in 2001 from a tomb in Inner Mongolia and is made of gold filigree and inlaid with carnelian. Presumably there were other stones too, but they are no longer available. Um, in the history of the Yuan dynasty, bokta are not described, but men's court dress is. Women's court dress is never described. And it's like, why? Um, with particular attention paid to, paid to something called a jisun or jama suit, gifted to the Khan's officials by the Khan and named for the banquet at which these suits were worn. These suits are described in detail, including the precious stones and pearls sometimes used to adorn them. The name for the pearls used on these suits of clothes is dana, which comes from the Persian, and red stones are called yakut, another translated Persian word, um, which were also said to adorn these outfits. It seems to me that the pearls and perhaps the carnelian or other reddish stones used to adorn courtly bokta probably came from the same sources as those used on men's jisun court robes. If this is the case, then I think it can be argued that the adornments of the bokta were not simply used because they were beautiful, but also because they showed the reach of the Mongol empire. These pearls, called by their Persian name, almost certainly came from the Persian Gulf or perhaps the Coromandel coast. They were probably called by their Persian name because they were imported by Persian speaking traders. The carnelian probably came from the present day Bengal region. I realize that hyacinth, the translation of yakut, is an actual stone, but yakut may have also referred to various red-hued stones originating outside of East Asia during the Yuan period, so it is possible that carnelian may have been called 
by this name at the time. It's hard to be certain. As with the Dana pearls, I think the term Yakut was used because the Persian speaking traders who brought this into the Mongol Empire. The use of these stones in courtly robes, and I think in Bokta, was a way of physically demonstrating both the wealth and the extent of the Mongol Empire through both conquest and established trading routes. Although the most embellished versions of the Bokta have been unearthed in China and Mongolia, these distinctive caps were found elsewhere in the empire as well. Of course, we know from paintings of the Yilhanate that they were worn in courtly contexts in the Western part of the Mongol Empire. But they have also been excavated in present day Russia, the territory of the Golden Horde, both in Siberia and in the lower Volga region in the south. In Western Siberia, in the Ob River Basin, several tombs have been uncovered that preserve evidence of the Bokhta. Namely, the cemetery of Prokaleva V in the northern part of the northern Ob, Ob Basin, and the Telyut Vizvovs I cemetery located in the southern part of Western Siberia. Other Bokhta have been found in burials um, in the Altai. Oops, sorry, in the Altai region. And in several of these burials, archaeologists uncovered evidence for two different types of bokta. One, quote, funnel shaped, and the other, quote, more complex. <laughs> as far as I am able to tell from the excavation reports, although the birch bark armature of the bokta were to a certain extent preserved, the cloth that covered the exterior of the bokta was not, which actually contrasts with those excavated in China where the silk remains, but the armature often does not or is in very small fragmented pieces. Archaeologists speculate that the bokta uncovered from sites in the Golden Horde um, may have been covered with silk, citing examples from the Yuan Dynasty. So we know that Mongol women's court dress, the wide robe and the bokta were recognizable and worn across the empire. But why does this matter? And what is its significance in the Chinese context? The Mongol Yuan Dynasty was the first so-called conquest dynasty to rule over all of China. Prior to the Yuan, the Kitan Liao and the Jurchen Jin had ruled over large swaths of present day North China and Mongolia, but they had both coexisted with the Song Dynasty to the south. Both the Liao and the Jin co-opted a certain amount of Song court ceremony and dress as part of claiming legitimacy in the Chinese sphere. As I've argued elsewhere, royal Liao women stand out in the Chinese context for continuing to wear Kitan style dress at court, something we know about from historical records and which is backed up by funerary material. Prior to the founding of the Liao dynasty in the early 10th century, elite non-Chinese women depicted in the Chinese sphere usually wore Chinese style dress. We know this from historical records which describe dress in court ceremonies and we can't find corresponding evidence in funerary depictions of Sogdians and Xianbei couples from the sixth century. In the case of the Xianbei example here, everyone except for the central female figure wears non-Chinese dress. As for the Sogdian example, the women wear dress in Chinese style where the men wear Sogdian clothing, which by that I mean a kaftan, trousers and boots. Basically, until the founding of the Liao in 906, the dress of power for women in the Chinese cultural sphere was Chinese. When Liao royal women continued to wear Kitan dress in a courtly context after the establishment of their dynasty, even when the Liao emperor and his officials sometimes wore Tang or Song style dress, they were drawing attention to the difference between themselves and Song dynasty women. Women and especially elite women from groups tied to the steppe and Turkic cultures such as the Kitan, Jurchen, and Mongols enjoyed a much more active role in both household affairs and politics than those who lived to their south in China. This was certainly the case with the relatively autonomous and politically active women living in the Liao and their increasingly sequestered southern neighbors living in the northern Song. Kitan, Jurchen, and Mongol women were able equestrians and were expected to know how to shoot from horseback hunt and even go to war if it was required. We have documented instances of women leading troops into battle from all three of these groups. The most obvious sartorial representation of this physical freedom was found in footwear. 
Song women increasingly practice foot binding, which is thought to have originated in the Southern Song, which literally restricted their movement, while Khitan, Jurchen, and Mongol women wore boots in a quotidian context, practical footwear for an active life in cold climates. Liao royal women set the precedent for continuing to wear Khitan dress in Chinese cultural contexts, and when the Mongols conquered all of China, they went a step further. No one at their court wore Chinese style court dress, except perhaps in very specific performative ritual circumstances. The dress of the Yuan court was definitively Mongol and the women wore the bokta and the wide court robe. The Mongols did not mandate Mongol style dress for the populations over which they ruled in contrast to the Manchu Qing dynasty a few centuries later. But as we shall see, certain elites seem to have elected to represent themselves as Mongols through their dress, which I argue is a type of sartorial code switching. I'll explore this concept a little bit more in the second half of my talk. We should also consider how quickly Mongol court dress became the dress of power. From the Hurlatai or princely Congress when Chinggis Khan confederated various groups from the area of present day Mongolia to form the group we call the Mongols in 1206, to the first dated representations of the Bukta and the court robe outside a purely Mongol context in the Dongart Sun tomb from Shanxi in 1269, which you see here, only 63 years had passed. Indeed, Kublai took power in 1260, but he did not fully conquer the Song dynasty in 1271. Yet by 1269, two years before the founding of the Yuan dynasty, Mongol women's dress was well enough established for a Northern Chinese woman to be memorialized in death wearing Mongol courtly garb. The fact that Northern Chinese people were represented in death dressed as Mongols was first pointed out by Nancy Steinhardt in a 2008 article. It is particularly striking that this couple should have chosen to be portrayed as Mongols in death because these painted tombs fit squarely within a broader funerary tradition in North China. This is not a Mongol cost custom. Presumably the only people who would have seen these paintings were the children and grandchildren of the couple during the funeral, and then the tomb would have been sealed up. So it was hardly a public statement made to convey a political message. I haven't talked about it yet, but obviously the fact that the vast majority of material remains of dress in the Yuan context came from tombs presents its own set of challenges. Indeed, it might be the moment to take a closer look at tombs and what they might tell us about the people who are presenting themselves as Mongol during the Yuan dynasty. The territory of the Yuan dynasty in present day China and Mongolia provides some of the most robust evidence for Mongol period dress, thanks to the continuation of Chinese style burial practices. Wealthy families would bury their dead in painted tombs with a variety of burial goods. I've counted 40 tombs thus far that have been excavated from the Yuan period that preserve paintings of dress and textiles, 10 sites that preserve textiles and clothing, and another eight tombs with stone carvings or statues showing dress. I'm still in the process of evaluating this corpus, but I'll give some general comments about these tombs before looking more closely at two examples which preserve a number of textiles and other items of adornment. First, the painted tombs. The painted tombs are found all over North China and Mongolia, including the provinces of Hebei, Inner Mongolia, Shandong, Shanxi, and Shanxi. The occupants of these painted tombs, while often dressed in the style of the Mongol court, were not ethnically Mongol. And by that, I mean descendant from one of the initial groups originating in present day Mongolia, confederated by Chinggis Khan in 1206. But in fact, they were Northern Chinese, which was an ethnic category in the Yuan dynasty, which included those descended from the Khitan and the Jurchen. The tombs of the Mongols themselves are found in present day Mongolia, but the funerary customs of the Mongols were different from the Northern Chinese. Mongol graves unearthed from the period of the Mongol Empire in the 13th and 14th centuries are cave burials rather than specially constructed tombs. And while people were buried with grave goods, only a few burials from this period have been found with textiles in them. As cave burials were not tombs specifically constructed for burial, they were not painted either. So we have a situation in the Yuan territories where the vast majority of evidence for Mongol dress is preserved in the tombs of people who were not in fact Mongol, but dressed as Mongols, at least in the funerary context. As I mentioned earlier, the Yuan emperors did not force populations under their rule to wear Mongol dress. Rather, cultural cross-dressing or code switching was a marker of political status. 
dressing as a Mongol associated the wearer with the ruling elite. In other words, the type of clothing worn in the Mongol period was not necessarily an ethnic marker, but a political statement. This assumption of a sartorial Mongol identity was clearly important as it was memorialized in death, which was a significant indicator of the power of identifying with the Mongols at the time. This marks a departure from previous dynasties when the clothing of power in the Chinese cultural sphere was that of the Chinese court, with both the Kitan Liao and the Jurchen Jin making use of Chinese court dress to help legitimize their own claims to power. It is clear that the dress of the Yuan court was Mongol and male Mongol court dress was basically an elaborated version of quotidian dress with a belted riding jacket worn over trousers with boots and a hat. Women on the other hand had other types of clothing available to them. And with the exception of the female occupant in the Dong Erzun tomb, the female tomb occupant usually wears a version of quotidian dress that is distinct from the court robe and a good deal more practical. So we see that in the woman wearing the white robe on, on the right. <clears throat> Usually this takes the form of a long sleeve robe that closes to the left, worn with a full or three quarter length sleeve jacket, which may be worn open or closed. These women have often been identified in late 20th century and early 21st century scholarship as wearing Chinese dress. But in fact, this style of clothing and its left side closing is distinct from the styles of the Song dynasty. So I think we can safely call it Yuan dress. And it was certainly widespread across North China as evidence from funerary material. I'm spending time talking about this because it ties into my greater interest in what it meant to identify as a Mongol subject in China outside of the court. The women portrayed in these occupant images, if they wear hats, wear close fitting caps similar to those worn by Kitan women from, three, from a, uh, centuries earlier, and they often wear earrings. Historical narratives and canonical descriptions, sorry, um, historical narratives and canonical descriptions of dress in China tell us that non-Chinese people close their robes to the left, not the right, and earrings are associated with Northern groups, but not those living in the Chinese heartland. The women in these images are thus presenting a specific identity in these funerary portrayals, one that allies them with the North over the South and perhaps the Mongols over the Song. Let's keep these observations in mind as we move to look at tombs with remains of textiles and objects of personal adornment. Tombs and hordes with textiles are found both in Mongolia and in North and South China. In addition to sites and cemeteries uncovered in Inner Mongolia, Gansu, Xinjiang, Hebei, Shandong provinces, two undisturbed Yuan tombs were excavated in the 1960s in Jiangsu province in the Southeast. Today, I'm going to show you some objects from the cemetery of the Wanshixian clan in Gansu province in present day Northwest China, as well as some items from the tomb of Qian Yu and his wife in Jiangsu province in Southeast China. Wang Shixian was a Jurchen military leader of the Jin dynasty who surrendered to the Mongols in 1235 and immediately began serving the Mongol army in the same capacity as he had the Jin. After his death in 1243, he was awarded posthumous titles and his descendants continued to serve the Mongols as high ranking military officials and the line more or less continued to flourish into the Ming dynasty. The family cemetery contains a total of more than 270 tombs spanning 14 generations. And the earliest tomb is from 1243, that's Wang Shuxian's tomb, and the latest is from 1616. Several of these tombs were excavated in the 1970s. 29 additional tombs were excavated beginning in 2011. So as you can imagine, there's a great quantity of material from this site. I will show you only a few objects from the Yuan Dynasty that have direct bearing on Yuan Dynasty's women's dress today. In contrast to this, the tomb of Qian Yu and his wife is the tomb of only this couple, so not a cemetery complex. Fortunately, it was undisturbed prior to discovery in 1960. So it preserves a quantity of material, including 28 items of clothing, mostly women's dress. Qian Yu is a descendant of the king of Wu Yue, which was one of the most powerful kingdoms during the five dynasties and 10 kingdoms period that occurred in China after the fall of the Tang dynasty. I need to find out more about Qian Yu. He doesn't appear to be listed in the history of the Yuan dynasty, but he may be written about elsewhere. The elaborate materials interred with him, however, indicate that his family flourished 
under the Yuan, which was not the case for many Chinese Southern elites. Clothing and adornment items from the Wang Shixian clan cemetery dating to the Yuan dynasty adhere to what we would expect to find in an elite Yuan military family's burial site, including jade and gold belt plaques and buckles and wide brimmed hats and hat ornaments. These correspond to clothing articles we see depicted in Yuan tombs and described in Yuan texts. In terms of women's dress, we find jackets of the sort depicted in Yuan tomb murals as well as gold earrings and hairpins. These objects provide valuable evidence that supplement the depictions in funerary murals for elite dress during this period. For my purposes today, however, they also provide a comparison to the materials found in Chen Yu's tomb in the South. The conventional view of Yuan history tells us that Song customs, including dress, were to an extent maintained in the South. This may be true, but the evidence from the Chen Yu tomb complicates the picture of life during the Mongol period in Southern China. Chen Yu's tomb contained a variety of clothing items, including vests, pants, skirts, and robes. Although I have not been able to source many images of these in color, but the ones that I could find I did include. Here's an image of a woman's vest made of patterned gauze. In terms of elite textiles, silk gauze, and Damask were weaves favored in the southern part of the Yuan dynasty in contrast to the north, which favored polychrome silks with a brocading weft and lampuses, both frequently woven with gold threads. In addition to the materials, the cut of the women's clothing preserved in the Chen Yu tomb seems to be typical of Song style dress. Significantly, archeologists believe that the clothing was worn by the couple in life not just created for the funerary context. When we turn to some of the objects of adornment and the shoes, however, a pic the picture becomes a bit more complex. Two pairs of women's shoes were found in the tomb, one padded with cotton and the other unpadded, both made of silk. This is an image of the unpadded silk pair, which you can see are also embroidered. Both pairs of shoes are about 20 centimeters long, meaning they were for, were for a woman with unbound feet. I literally measured my own feet to like make sure that this was like around, I mean, smaller than my feet, but it's like close. Um, <laughs> for comparison, shoes that are for bound feet are usually about 13 centimeters long. Foot binding originated in the Southern Song Dynasty. So it seems significant that the wife of this prominent Southern family would have had unbound feet. Another interesting find within the tomb was a pair of amber and silver earrings. As I mentioned earlier, earrings were culturally associated with Northern peoples. So Chen Yu's tomb gives us evidence that his wife, a Southern Chinese woman who came from a prominent family may have worn earrings and had unbound feet. And although I'm not focusing on men's dress here, I wanted to show you a couple of belt buckles, good, because people are interested in belts here, um, that also tie to the north. And here is a jade one of a falcon attacking a swan, which is similar to the one found in the Wang Shixian Cemetery that I showed you earlier. And um, here's a stunning gold belt buckle with a tapir design, so pretty cool. Um, as Chen Yu's family was clearly allowed to flourish during the Yuan, he presumably was allied with the Mongols in some capacity. So perhaps we can take these objects as clues that point to the possibility that he and his wife took part in sartorial code switching in specific contexts. While the textiles point to the South, the shoes, belt buckles, and earrings indicate connections to the North. The archeological record helps to complicate the picture of cultural division and affinity that often characterize our studies of the Yuan dynasty. The similarity between some of the objects in the Wang Shixian clan tombs and Chen Yu's tomb hinted the ways in which elites from different backgrounds and geographies may have related to the Mongol empire, at least sartorially. These tombs provide small hints of diversity and connection that I hope we'll, I'll be able to flesh out more completely as I continue on this new project. I feel like that we are at the beginning of something new, not just showing the reach and power of Mongol courtly and elite culture, 
but also the ways in which was, this was interpreted by different people in a variety of places. Whether this is manifested in something as distinct as the bukta or as subtle as earrings, a more interesting picture of people living in the Mongol Empire is beginning to emerge. I look forward to your questions during the Q&A and thank you.